It's Cowboy Bebop Part 2 out of probably four parts. Okay, nice. Here we go into Episode 8. Weep! These suspicious people are heading to Venus with their guns. Tom is killed. Ah, terrorism. That makes sense. Spike accidentally beats up the space pirates in his sleep. Faye comes in with the layup. This man is aggressively trying to sell his sack. He attempts seduction. It is ineffective. Spike gets some bounty cash, is robbed by Faye, then assaulted by the beige stranger. He pleads with Spike for self-defense lessons. Spork ardently refuses, but is hounded. Spike accepts weird space drugs from his stalker. It was oregano, however, and Spike is upset. Rocco Bonaro is eccentric. Jet googles their next targets. Here they are. Spunk teaches Rock how to be a liquid. He isn't very good at it though. Rocco suddenly forces his sack upon Sprite and scurries away. His pursuers look familiar. Jet gives Spike the scoop back at HQ. They're after these guys, who are after Rocco, who stole this plant that supposedly cures space aids. Rocco evades the lawyers by taking asylum with the mole people. Faye wants to peddle their weed, whereas Jet wants nothing to do with it. Spike is only interested in Rocco and recites poetry as he walks away. Rocco's house is kind of freaky, but I can dig it. When you don't have doors, home defense is important. The woman is blind and frail. Spike mentions Rocco, who is currently having a surprise tinkle with the bad guys. Rocco's sister, Stella, explains that she has space aids, which is expensive to treat. She shares her cool box with Spike, all while singing Rocco's praises. She worries for Rocco's safety, however. Spike finds some kind of floppy egg in her magic box and stares longingly out the window. Faye is ogled in a dingy bar, strangles a pleb, then shoots everyone. Jet reveals that the pouch Spike misappropriated contains magical beans, which sprout the cure for mega aids. Rocco is threatened and beaten by Morpheus. Faye is not allowed at orgies anymore. Spike and Rico meet up for the botanical exchange and briefly converse. Spike reveals his profession, to which Rocco exercises caution. Ah, but Stella requires the juice from a small plant. Rocco warns Spike of imminent danger. The danger emerges. Jazz music intensifies as gunfire rings out amidst the polyphonic ragtime and blues. Faye finally found her way to the bounty. Jet is here too. Rocky is one with the flow at last, but forgot that he was in a gunfight. His precious medicine withers. I would have followed you, my brother, my captain, my king. He leaves Stella in Spike's supple hands and dies. Sometime later, Spike probably sold the seeds to finance Stella's medical bills. She is excited at first, but after caressing Spike's face a little bit, she understands. Stella remains stoic at the grievous news and asks Spike what Rocco looked like. He responds by stating she already knows nose without looking, and texts her a thumbs up emoji. Spike eats a raw tomato and stares up at the deluge of plant jizz. A depressed robot draws friends in the sand with space lasers. This androgynous little fella is mentally wiggling around on the internet and becomes excited about the bebop. The planet they're on is pretty messed up. Ein is watching the news report on a notorious hacker who graffitied the planet. Money. The bebop gets going. Spike decides to sit this one out, and Faye insults the entirety of the IT industry. Oh, a banged up planet is Earth. The news conveniently explains that a hyperspace gate explosion changed everything, and the Earth folk are mole people now. Looking at the enigmatic gremlin's eyelashes, I'm assuming they are a girl but it probably doesn't matter. Her name is Edward. The Popo go for an arrest, but Ed steals their boat and disappears into a mountain of rubbish. Jet and Faye begin the search for their quarry while the Bebop is hacked. Ed finds out about her bounty. She proves difficult to find, with many locals offering cryptic guesses at best. Jed is sold Piyokos, whatever the space jazz that is. Ed psychologically wiggles into some kind of alien robot god by accident. One of the satellites developed consciousness and was lonely in space. Ed makes friends with it, names it MPU, and does acrobatics in excitement. Jet gives Spike a potato and they discuss their findings, which are scant. Meanwhile, Ed discovers that MPU was trying to recreate some of Earth's cool tattoos from before it was horribly marred. The police cut their phone lines. Ed sends a signal to the Bebop, stating pragmatically that Ed is Ed and MPU is their bounty. She tells the crew everything, including how to download MPU onto a flash drive. Apparently, if they mess up, every satellite in 
orbit will go berserk. Spike loves to be assailed by bloodthirsty robots and heads out. Ed reveals her allegorical viewership by being a genderless spectator of the Bebop's journeys. Spike goes to manually extract MPU from its vacuous prison and makes an attempt to disable the security. He misses with his beam. The satellites go freaking nuts. Ed gives the crew an excellent strategy. Spike slurps MPU out of its husk and deposits it into Ed's gaming rig. Ed convinces MPU to be copied so its clone could be arrested. Isn't that kind of messed up though? Like, if MPU is sentient, then its exact replica would be as well? And how are they going to punish a conscious AI anyway? Maybe I shouldn't think about it too much. Spike and Jet hand MPU's floppy disk into the police and swagger away. Faye intends to deny her promise to take Ed with them. Ed is sad. Unfortunately for Faye, Ed is also all-powerful. She earns her place beside the crew of the Bebop. The Gigababe on TV divulges the news that bounties for non-organic lifeforms don't count. Spike, partially inspired by the lack of money and this news, is enraged by the eclectic composition of his crew. I think Ed drew a face on what is probably South America. America, by the way. Ayn is abused by a caveman, who is abused in turn by Ed. She is feral. Jet has a hallucination involving a watch and a short-haired lady. He is pestered by the crew for being distant. Faye eventually lands on a soft spot and sinks her teeth in. Boeing gets a Skype call from an old colleague, Donnelly. Jet states his purpose for visiting Ganymede and they reminisce. He used to be a cop, as suspected by Faye. Donnelly mentions a certain Elisa, who owns a bar now. That name causes Jet distress, and he cinematically wonders around town in response. Spike gets paid and verbally eviscerates Faye for being shallow. Faye tries to teach Ed how to be sexy, but is only gyrated on. Jet enters the aforementioned bar, is accosted by a hooligan, and encounters his old flame. She tells him that things are rough and she's closing shop. The twitchy hooligan from before is her boyfriend, much to Jet's distress. He cryptically places his stopwatch on the counter. Spike is doing shoddy maintenance work on his car when he gets his spicy tip-off for a bounty nearby. Rent Salonius, Elisa's gigolo boy toy. Ed and Faye relax. Faye is orange. Jet recalls the moment Asia left him. That is her watch. He made a deal with himself to leave the planet if she didn't return by the time that clock stopped. Jet's only reason for seeking her out now is for closure. She gives him an extremely vague answer and leaves again. Rent reflects on last night's charades. He did a sneaky murder and is currently panicking. Jet smells his unease. It reeks, but he continues along. Meanwhile, Spike has disrupted traffic on the freeway. Rent is paranoid. They're deep in some real nasty gangster mafia horseplay and decide the best option is to immediately elope. Spike intercepts them and begins to unload. They have a brief chase and a nearly fatal aerial incident. Jet gets the bad news. What I'm pretty sure is Kiss from a Rose by Seal starts playing. He takes it like a champ and goes to confront the ghosts of his past. They dramatically chase each other around like a couple of deer prancing in the forest of life. Jet launches his tremendous hook, pinning the criminals in place. Elisa gives Jet a somber look and their propellers explode. Back on the shore, Jet hands Elisa some hard decisions. She is terrified by her reckoning and misses every shot, either by choice or from fear. Finally, the closure Jet deserves. All it took was a smidgen of gun violence. Elisa reveals how Jet was always right, always perfect, and it made her feel like a child. She left because because she wanted to make her own decisions, apparently. So I guess we know the outcome of those choices now. Rent is beaten and turned over to the authorities. Jet bids his ex adieu, tossing that silly watch into the sea. The lesson here is to talk to your significant other about relational disturbances, rather than enigmatically leaving and inciting years of deep emotional trauma into your beloved. Something is slithering around in a hole. Jet writes in his diary. Faye cheats at dice, and Spike makes a gross kebab. Ein senses the wiggle worm. Jet gambled his clothes away and recites poetry in the shed. He finds a mystery fridge. Faye counts her spoils. Spike fails to lecture Faye on morals, and an alarm sounds. Jet was nibbled on by the creature. Everyone assumes it was just a rat until Jet mentions the fridge. Hey, yo, what's that doing here? 
Ayn is worried. Faye seems to be worried, too. Spike introduces Jet to some funky space drugs. Ayn paws at the walls. Jet begins to feel ill and downs Spronk's green juice. He dies. There is some purple gunk where he was bitten. Spike quickly does some googling, but the poison remains a mystery. Ayn attempts to warn the crew in his silence. Ed's practical understanding of the situation reveals that the only explanation is a horrible space creature. Everyone is perplexed. A goop drops from the bathroom ceiling and is glimpsed by Faye. Ed is bequeathed infrared vision, but gets distracted. Spike peeps the creature only to assume it's a glitch. Faye bursts into the living room, revealing that she was bitten. She laments her misfortune and faints out of distress. Ed and Ayn begin their search for the monster. They are separated and Ayn is attacked. Spike comes to his rescue, however. He spots the slippery varmint, then narrowly escapes his noxious bite. With three of the five members down, Spike goes Rambo. The search proves to be difficult, as expected, I suppose. Spike finds traces of Ed, but none of the creature. He is spooked by a gloopy drip. The alien goes for a sneaky, but Spike has inhuman reflexes. He is repelled and gasses the chamber in the escape. Flamethrower time. Wait. Gun first, I guess. Spike lands a hit after a few misses, which allows him to go for the finishing move. The crisp smell of charred space creature reminds Spike of his gross kebab. The thought gives him a brain blast and triggers a flashback. One year ago, he purchased a lobster to eat and placed it in the mystery fridge. He forgot about it and, well, yeah. The best course of action is to launch the decomposing Lovecraftian monstrosity into space. The desiccated beast survived. It attempts to defend its gross nest by assaulting Spike. Sent flying by the sudden combat, the fridge begins to open. Spike manages to launch it into space though. He abruptly succumbs to the bite and loses his grasp on the airlock's handhold. Luckily, Ed has an iron constitution and consumes the weakened grouchy goo in her sleep. The refrigerator spins gracefully to a waltz through the stippled up umbra of space. The old wizard from episode 1 touches some sand, telling his pupil of the tear of a warrior. That probably means somebody died. Vicious is a drug dealer at the beck and call of these weird wrinkly triplet overlords called the Van. They send him on a mission to Callisto, a cold and ruthless moon. I'm pretty sure there is either some sexual tension here, or Vicious is planning to overthrow them. Vicious immediately reveals his mutinous intentions to his co-worker. Spike awakens to an intense heat. Faye had a bipolar episode drank all the antifreeze, robbed the biba, and skedaddled again. Ed does her usual doom scrolling and comes across a name, Julia. Spike is shook. Ed finds the source, the blue crow, on Callisto. Spike quickly readies for departure. Ayn is slain. Jed attempts to quell Spikey's eagerness by using logic. He fails. Spike and Bet have a brief falling out after their disagreement of priorities. Neither of them seem actually upset at each other, but what do I know? Faye is moping in a tavern that just happens to be the Blue Crow. Spike inquires about Julia from a few of the residents and gets a lead about a sax player called Grin. That guy's probably Grin. He flirts with Faye, declares his homosexuality, and points out all the pervy heteros in the crowd. Gwen reveals that Callisto contains no women, so she should be careful. Faye swaggers away. Spike is stalked by some masked thugs who think he's vicious. He's enraged by their confusion and goes berserk. I just want to point out that that doesn't necessarily prove he isn't vicious. In fact, he's quite vicious because he's tearing them apart. The leader of the masked marauder spills all of his beans. Gran and Vicious are rumored to be drug lords, so the goons figured they'd be able to squeeze some quick cash out of their deal. They were clearly mistaken, however. The defeated bandit reveals that the codename for their supposed exchange is Julia. Jet enters a bar, sulks, then the TV reveals that Gran is a wanted man. Faye is attacked by the miserable miscreants from before and is rescued by Gran. They find refuge at his house and begin conversing over drinks. Faye justifies her solitude by stating that it's better to be lonely and alone than lonely with others. Glam absolutely obliterates her feeble platitudes by explaining that she cut her ties with the crew too soon, that Faye left because she started to enjoy their company and feared growing attached. They stare at each other for a couple of seconds, then Grin goes to shower. Faye is ogling Graham's memorabilia when his phone goes off. She stares intently at a silver-haired soldier in the war photo. Vicious leaves a voicemail and Spike emerges 
emerges from the wintry haze. They prepare to settle the score. When the junior, Lin, intervenes, now aware of her endangerment, Faye intrudes on Grin's sensual bathing. Vicious reveals that Julia was in town, and Lin brandishes his glocky. That's a woman, if I've ever seen one. Or, I guess not. Lin blasts Spork. Grin tells Faye about the war on Titan, and has a flashback of when he and Vicious met. Grin inquires about the song produced by this little trinket, to which Vicious cryptically replies, Julia, and bequeaths it to Grin. Back in the present, Glenn reveals how he was falsely imprisoned by Vicious, went insane, and did a colossal amount of drugs, causing him to grow some nice honkers. Grin intends to ask Vicious why he was betrayed. Faye informs him of his folly, but is deflected. She attempts to assassinate him for some reason, and fails. Jet finds out that Faye is teetering around somewhere on Callisto. He is also informed of Julia, who wandered into the Blue Crow a couple years back. Spike has some weird dreams while passed out. He's disappointed to not be dead, and lights up a ciggy. Jet slinks into Grin's apartment, and unsurprisingly finds Faye lying imprisoned on a bed. Spike gets a call from Jet, who tells him about Grin's bounty. That's Grin all dressed up on his way to see Vicious, who doesn't know Grape is a hermaphrodite. Faye is depressed, and converses with Jet. Neither of them know who this Julia woman is. The baddies do their deal. Grin exposes his identity and explodes. He then reveals that Julia discovered Vicious's transmitter within the music box. Grin doesn't understand that the Vicious in his head is not the Vicious in real life, and he starts blasting. Lin is kill. Everyone scrams to their boats. Sprite and Vicious dogfight a little bit. Grin shows up and is rocketed. Spike becomes culpable of international terrorism, but avoids being detonated for now. Grin put a bomb in that sack. Vicious probably escapes, though. Spike goes to Grin's wreckage to inquire about Julia. Grin is already senile from blood loss and wishes to die on Titan. Spike complies and is recognized for having multicolored eyes, just as described by Julia. Grin goes on to report that that she was always wearing a Wobogon smile and is sent into space for a dramatic funeral. Spike returns to the Bebop empty-handed, but amongst friends. The warrior's tear falls from the sky, is observed by the wizard, and that's the end of part two of Cowboy Bebop. Hi, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. I have a Patreon. If you wanna, if you wanna, um. You want to subscribe to that, I guess? This, uh, subscribing is the thing that you do for that. Su subscribing. There's more of this garbage on my channel if you're interested. Uh, thanks again. Bye.